I said, you know, you're going to lose anyway, so at least you know you've lost to a champ. So there was a bit of an intimidation. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't want to get too close. Speaking of your time in hospital, what would you say was the biggest revelation or change in perspective that you experienced? First night I took her out, driving home, I said to her, you know, uh, you, we can take a long time or a short time, but I'm happy to marry you tomorrow. Hi everyone and welcome back to the channel. Today is an absolute highlight for me because I'm sitting here with my father, who is not only my personal hero, but an icon to many South Africans. Today, I want to let you in behind the scenes to get to know the man behind the name a little bit better. Dad, so we're going to start with a round of true or false questions. The very first one is that you once told your friend Martin Rag while you were out in the freezing cold waters of Clifton that you're very happy to have him there beside you, not because it's a special bonding moment, but because it cuts your risk of being eaten by a shark in half. That is exactly right. And as I told you, there's only one recorded instance of somebody being eaten by a shark off the beaches of Clifton. It happened in 1943, and that man happened to come from Uppington. So I have a suspicion that these sharks here are particularly interested in people from Uppington. True or false, you love playing pranks on your friends. Yeah, and they play pranks on me too. Sure. Now, did you once tell Dave McKay, who was boarding a private plane with you all, that he could come on board, but for weight restriction purposes, he could not bring his paw paw that he had in a plastic bag? No, I didn't tell him. Uh, his brother-in-law, who was the pilot, who had just qualified as a pilot and were now very meticulous on every rule that has to be followed, he refused for Dave to bring Dave's paw paw on board because he said that would put it over the weight limit. How did Dave take that? I know Dave never spoke to the brother-in-law again. I mean, he, he never forgave him. He had to leave his pawpaw in the checkers bag, sitting on the tarmac <laughs> at Lanceria. To his dying day, whenever we teased him about it, he still got furious. I mean, he just couldn't believe this brother-in-law. He said, are you crazy if the margin of error <laughs> for the aeroplane is the weight of a pawpaw, then we must stay here. Is it also true that you once flew in an aircraft where the wing was strapped on with tape? No, what did happen, an aircraft that I owned, a Pilatus PC-12, we landed at Lan William, and there were, we were eight men in the plane and there was a slight incline where the plane was parked and as we got out of the plane in the wrong sequence, the plane dropped on its tail, on its rudder, and the rudder tore. Uh, you could see the cables inside and uh, our pilot and the man whose landing strip we landed on, they fixed it with duct tape and we flew from St. William back to Cape Town. Dad, a true or false, I recently gave you a cashmere blanket to drape over yourself when you came home from hospital. You were watching telly and I wanted to make you nice and comfortable. And you then said to me, no, Clara, that blanket is too fancy. Rather give me the Starlight Classics yeah. free concert blanket. Yeah. Do you prefer that blanket? I prefer that blanket. Why? To a comfort blanket. Well, it's not that fancy. I mean, it's... You are a little bit of a hoarder. Yeah, uh, regrettably, yes. Recently, when you were in hospital, you asked us to bring you a shaver that didn't require water to shave your face. Yeah. You then pinpointed exactly in your cupboard where we could find that shaver. We subsequently went... The battery shaver, yeah. We subsequently went and retrieved it, only to find that it cost you 42 rand, which means it was bought back in the maybe 1970s, and yeah. it was already rusting and leaking battery acid. So you're not a big fan of throwing things away? No, but I'm planning one of the resolutions that I took in hospital mm. uh, was that I am going to start dishoarding. Decluttering. Decluttering. True or false, you once met the King of Greece and when he asked you what you do for a living, you said, I'm a shopkeeper. Yeah, and he looked quite shocked <laughs> uh, that I would be you know, a guest at this very exclusive dinner and uh, shopkeeper, he said. 
So I think Elita asked him, uh, asked me, but uh, in order, she was the hostess. So she tried to cover, she said, but how many shops do you have? And I said, I think about 5,000. And the king was then a little bit less of a king. Okay, so now we are moving on to some rapid fire questions. Yeah. Which means you just answer the first thing that comes into your head. Yeah. What do you call yourself during your famous matches games when you are always the scorecard keeper with your friends at Willoughby's? What is the name at the top of well, your column? My, we all have nom de guerres. We all play under different names. Mm -hmm. And my Italian friend and partner, uh, Diego, mm. promised that he would buy me a title of prince. In Italy, you can buy, you know, a title and you get a sash and a crest and everything. He hasn't given it yet. So I play under the name Principi, which is the Italian for prince. Yes, but somehow not, I think not everyone else has such flattering... No, some here. of them have uh, really you know, names with meaning. Predating that, you used to call yourself champion. Yeah, champ, yeah. Champ. Yeah, just to try to intimidate the other players. I mean, I said, you know, you're going to lose anyway, so at least you know you've lost to a champ. Which famous person that you've met has made the biggest impression on you? I don't really know. I happened to have been fortunate enough to meet a lot of very prominent people. I'm, you know, met John Major, the former Prime Minister of Britain, several times. I was at dinners with him and at meetings. I met Tony Blair, who's also a former Prime Minister. I met the Queen once, very briefly, and uh, impressed her. But she asked me, what are the beautiful trees at Vergelegen? And I could tell her that they are camphor trees. And Mama was absolutely impressed that I knew the answer straight off. Tell me the story about Lady Diana. Lady Diana, I met very briefly at a dinner, but uh, there were two things for which you and Christina blamed me that I never chatted more to her. But the problem is I was wearing a new pair of shoes, uh, patent leather, and I thought that they would creak. That, so I didn't get too close to her. <laughs> And uh, the second thing is she was taller than I was. She was wearing very, very high heels in that famous blue dress. Yes. And uh, I thought she was taller than I was. So there was a bit of an intimidation. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't want to get too close. And because of the shoes, she was an absolutely stunning looking woman. She was coming out of the bathroom as I was walking towards the dining room. And I just said, good evening. And she said, and she was waiting for me to have a chat. Hmm. But with the shoes, I thought, well, I just said, right, please go ahead. I met Elon Musk at one of the meetings I had with Neil Ferguson. Uh, so there isn't yeah. really one person that made a particularly no, strong impression, no. but some people that have been interesting to you along yeah. the way. Yeah, they're, they're all interesting people. What is your pet peeve? When I was lying in the hospital and thought, you know, I'm. I'm on the verge. I decided not to be upset by things like that anymore. But uh, I do hate being interrupted. Speaking of your time in hospital, what would you say was the biggest revelation or change in perspective that you experienced? I guess the first thought is just how vulnerable we all are. You can think you're going to live forever, but you do get these wake up calls and you suddenly realize that, uh, you know, the doctors are all very well and the hospitals are all very well, uh, but there is only one power that can determine what becomes of you. And uh, if you are a believer, you know that there is a great healer. And if it's his will that you will be healed, then that will happen. So now we're doing finish the sentence. I am inspired by Inter alia, my children. Daddy! Yeah. How can you say that? No, oh, I mean, it's, you know, as a parent, there are so many risks when you have children. Things can go so badly wrong. And uh, so I'm always grateful that my children turned out to be children that I'm proud of. 
Secondly, I am grateful for? Just about everything because I grew up being taught by my mother virtually every day to count my blessings, not to be upset by those things that go wrong, but to be grateful for those things that go right. Inner peace comes when? You count your blessings. My mother used to tell me that if you think you've got problems, just walk to your neighbor and ask him what his problems are. And invariably, you will know that you'd rather not switch places. The best decision I ever made was? Convince Cara to marry me. Is it correct that you asked her for six years to marry you? Well, I asked her the first night I took her out. The very first night. I really want you to tell me the story of how you met Mama. I was in my final year at university and uh, I was chairman of the uh, judicial uh, committee, you know, the law students committee, and we had a once a year dance. And I went to this dance with a girlfriend. Of course. And at the dance, I saw this extremely beautiful girl who came there with somebody else. And uh, in those days, we still had a thing called a Paul Jones, you know, where you danced and then you changed partners. And I only waited for my opportunity and zeroed in on this girl. And she was very shy. And I asked her what her name was. And she said her name's Caro. Now she wasn't at Stellenbosch. It turned out that she was still at school. She was in matric. And uh, she wouldn't tell me what her surname is. But that evening driving back to Stellenbosch, my friend, Baggy, said to me, geez, you really zeroed in on that girl with the black hair tonight. And I said, Baggy, that's the girl I'm going to marry. What is it about her that made you come to that very swift realization? Well, I, you know, difficult to describe. I mean, obviously she was very, very pretty and uh, she had sort of grace and poise. And today I can't believe that she was shy. Neither can but, I. Yeah, <laughs> Neither no, can no, I. doesn't fit the pattern today, but uh, yeah, she was shy. And then how did you contact her? I mean, in those days, there wasn't SMS or Facebook or WhatsApp. No, no, no but she never gave me a surname. What did so she, I didn't know how to contact her. What did she say when you asked for her surname? No, she, she just said, no, you know, she just wouldn't give it. And she just said, my name's Carter and that's it. And, uh, did that intrigue you more? Yeah. But I was very busy in those days and kind of, you know, thought of her from time to time but uh, never did anything about it. And until a friend came from Vintuk of all places and said he's finally seen the girlfriend for me. And I said, well, who is she? And he told me and then I made a date and uh, I went to fetch her and at her residence at UCT. And when she came downstairs, this is two years later, I tried to have a what do you call it, a line, you know, when you try to impress a girl. And I said to her, my goodness, uh, you are even more beautiful than I was told you are by my friends. And, uh, oh, she said, thank you very much. And we got in the car and, you know, I kept on with this line. And she said, but don't you remember me? And I said, Look, if I'd ever seen you in my life before, there was no way that I was going to forget you. And then she said, oh, so you don't remember that you danced with me all night two years ago. Uh, that wasn't a good start no. to the relationship. No. Uh, but anyway, I managed to overcome it. Was there a big proposal? How did you propose in the end? No, the first night I took her out, Driving home, I said to her, you know, uh, you, we can take a long time or a short time, but I'm happy to marry you tomorrow. And she said, we'll see about that.
That's so romantic, yeah. Papa. Well, I don't know whether it's romantic. It was. How did you know she was the one? I don't know. I suppose one just knows. Do you believe in destiny? I believe in destiny when it comes to things like that, yes. On that topic of marriage, finish this sentence. The secret to a successful marriage is? Two words. Yes, dear. Okay. And there is a second, yes. there is a second qualification. You must both have the same attitude uh, towards air conditioning. Yes, that is a big problem because if you don't. It is, it, is a, it is a marriage breaker. When it's hot and the wife says, no, no, I don't want air conditioning. In the car or in the room, that is very difficult. But something one can overcome. Uh, yeah, well, you learn to live with it. Mainly the husband just does what the wife says. Life is? Wonderful. Life is wonderful.